Well, hello again, folks. Today we're starting into the Gospel of John. This, the fourth Gospel account in the New Testament, is very different, really, from the other three synoptic Gospels. Matthew, Mark and Luke seem to operate around a, a very obvious timeline. Matthew and Luke go from birth to death and resurrection. Mark goes from the beginning of Jesus' ministry until his death. John, however, goes about things a little bit differently. In some ways, where Matthew, Mark and Luke have listed kind of chronological details about Jesus' life, death and resurrection, John's Gospel seems to concern itself with understanding those details a little bit more, as if the writer was interpreting the story as it progresses. In terms of who wrote it or where it was written and when, well, that's a bit of a minefield. Uh, there's a great deal of scholarly debate that exists around all of those questions. One of the most commonly held views, of course, is that the disciple John, son of Zebedee, was heavily involved in the composition of the gospel, hence its name. John was one of the inner three, so to speak, along with his brother James and Simon Peter. It's also quite easy to see John as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Uh, you'll see that phrase as we read through this gospel. Uh, it it kind of pops up a couple of times to describe someone. Could it be John, son of Zebedee? Quite possibly. That being said, it is borderline impossible here to be 100% certain. One theory about the authorship is that the, the disciple John wrote quite a, a hefty chunk of this but it was then later put together into its more complete form by a team of editors known as the Johannine community. Now, without being 100% sure of the author, it's doubly hard then to pinpoint a date or a precise location of writing. It's most commonly assumed, however, that the gospel was written uh, after the other three, Matthew, Mark and Luke, and probably sometime towards the end-ish of the first century AD. Now, regardless of all this kind of uncertainty, what is certain is the writer wanted the focus to be on Jesus. He concerns himself with the truth and with testimony. John the Baptist gives testimony about Jesus. Jesus himself gives testimony about who he is. And the disciple whom Jesus loved gives testimony along with others. And in actual fact, when we skip to the end of chapter 20, uh, verses 30 and 31, we see that the writer has given a statement to explain exactly why he has written the book. Namely, that we would believe Jesus to be the Messiah, and so by believing, we may have life in his name. So everything that has been written and explained is so that we believe in Jesus as the chosen one of God, and so come to put our faith in him, in order that we may be saved and granted eternal life. Now, chapter 1 is a, a very iconic passage. It, it immediately links the New Testament to the Old. Uh, it has the very same beginning as the book of Genesis, those three words, in the beginning. In Genesis, it starts with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This, of course, meaning in the beginning of time. But before time even began, John's gospel points out that God was always there because he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So this word is obviously a person, given how he is spoken about in the passage. He's not a man, though. He is not being created. He must be eternal, as God is eternal. We're told he was with God, so they're like very close. But then we're told he was God. So this is someone who is so close to God that he is, in fact, God himself. And we're told that through him all things were made. So this is a powerful person, to say the least, one who is God in nature, one who is eternal, and one who is responsible for all creation. This is quite an opening statement. But in the rest of chapter 1, then, John begins to bring out these themes, which will later be picked up on throughout the gospel. So the theme, for example, of light and darkness, or perhaps of life and death, or the idea of being a witness, or, or testifying to the truth, and so on. And here he is simply introducing these themes as a way of explaining more uh, detail regarding who this word is and what he came to do. And that much begins to become clear as the verses go by. So the word is described as being a light, a light for all mankind, a, a true light, a light that shines in the darkness but is not overcome by darkness. 
So immediately we see what the Gospel of John is, is really all about. It's about revelation. And interestingly, it's revelation in two senses. There's an, an audible revelation, the word, and a physical revelation, the light. And in verse 6, John is introduced, but this John is not the writer of the gospel. This is John the Baptist. He's described as one who was sent from God and whose job was to point others to this word or this light. So John the Baptist cannot be the long-awaited Messiah. He is not the saviour, nor is he the redeemer. But he is the one who comes before. He is the one who comes to prepare the way. He's the one who comes to point us to the Saviour, the Messiah, the Redeemer. So then in verses 9 to 13, uh, an interesting development takes place. The writer describes how there are two groups of people. One group who kind of reject the light because they don't recognise the light for who he is. They don't see him as a, a life-giving light. They only see the darkness. The other group then... They recognize uh, the light, they receive him, they embrace him, they put their belief in him. And as a result, they're given a precious gift, according to verse 12, that is the right to become children of God, a, a legal standing to be considered God's own children. So in kind of summary here, the, the light has come into the world. And as he comes, if someone recognizes him for who he is, that person is blessed eternally since he is adopted into God's own family as his own child. And so immediately in this gospel here, uh, we have these kind of two groups that are formed. And I suppose the, the writer is is really asking the question, which group are you going to be in? Are you going to be in the group that, that don't recognize the light or the word? Or are you going to be in this group who do recognize him, who do receive him, who do believe in him and who become children of God? And then comes verse 13, that great testimony, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. So this is not some kind of philosophical or spiritual being. This word became flesh. This light, who is very much God, actually became flesh and blood, man, and lived in this world. What a profound statement. And then we're told that this person is in fact the son of God, the son who comes from God, who is God himself, and he has come to reveal God since he's the only one who can. And again, we're back to that kind of theme of being a witness and testifying. Verse 18 tells us, no one has seen God except the son who is from God, who is God. And so therefore no one can make God known except the Son. So this Son has entered the world as a light who brings life. He's come so that people accept him and believe in him in order to become God's children. And he's come then to reveal God to the world. What a start to this book. The remainder of the chapter, it's full of other fascinating things. John the Baptist is interrogated to see if he's the Messiah, but he does his job. And he says, no, he points us to the one who is. And so we come then to verse 29, a hugely important verse in this book. Jesus is acknowledged by John and designated as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So one of the functions of this sun, this light, this word is to remove sin. And that's, of course, a, a throwback to Old Testament language and imagery that the lamb, like the sacrificial lamb of the Passover in the days of the Exodus, or perhaps uh, it brings the goat to mind, uh, the goat of Leviticus, who is set free into the wilderness uh, to remove the, the sin of the people. So Jesus is that Lamb of God who removes sin himself. And John declares this man is the one. He points to Jesus. He acknowledges Jesus of Nazareth is no ordinary man. He is the Messiah. He's the Son. He's the Word. He's the light who gives life to all those who believe. So the chapter then finishes off really by bringing us to, to Jesus and then Jesus kind of calls a few people to follow him as his disciples and he's really preparing for his ministry on earth, uh, what would sadly only be a short ministry lasting but a few years. So with that we leave chapter 1, join us tomorrow though as we head into chapter 2. Until then, God bless. Mm -hmm.